Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Bill. This is Dennis. Okay. Bill, did I hear yeah. properly? Okay. Yes, uh, Dennis has been my, uh, I've been involved with Dennis for about 40 years, uh, a little over, actually over 40 years. Uh, he's helped me with a number of, uh, I guess, what do you call it, ventures and, and business. And we've worked together for 40 years and really have made a lot of progress in various areas over that time. And hopefully now we can make a lot of progress in solving global warming. Oh, yes. Uh, that is... Uh... A big issue, isn't it, facing us right now on all corners of the uh, of the United States as well as the rest of the world? Yeah. Yes, in some ways, it feels like it's almost too late if we don't really start moving very quickly. You could argue that we have reached tipping points, particularly with the release of methane off, you know, the site out of Siberia and elsewhere. That whatever we do to scramble to catch up and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions is not gonna be enough. You could argue that. I'm praying. And frankly, all we have is what we can do. I mean, if, you know, do what we can. It is, it is the salvation of human civilization. And God knows enough of them have disappeared over time. You know, this Byzantium and, um, the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks and others have left a few remnants behind for us to poke through, but do we really want to head the same place? I, uh, I, I understand what you're saying and that we are in a desperate situation. And I agree with you. Uh, I have, I've come to the conclusion over the last month that it seems like it's if we don't move quickly, it's going to be too late. Well, hopefully the, the heat and the fires in the West Coast, the dryness in the agricultural lands, the <laughs> condominium uh, failures in the wetland areas uh, of, and coastal areas of Florida, and a whole host of other things are a, wake, a, a sort of a combination wake-up call that might just, you know, be in time. Now, you know, there are there are the deniers. So that is that is one of the places we struggle to to communicate and find our our common humanity. I understand. Well, Dennis, I'm going to let you take over here. Dennis is usually who conducts the interviews. Uh, he has some questions I'd like to ask you and. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with us. Yeah, um, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Dennis Palahoff, and it's nice to meet you. We, we were talking just before we started about uh, the fact that it's interesting that an environmental group was put together uh, with elderly people, <laughs> older people. Mm -hmm. uh, on the surface, that might sound uh, sort of odd or that you would think younger people would have more energy. Uh, how did it all start? Well, Elders Climate Action, which is the group I, I am part of and I actually co-chair, was started in, I think, late 2014. I was not participating at the time. Uh, it's our parent organization is called Elders Action Network. And Elders Climate Action is one of the nodes or groups. And we're the first one to grow up out of the idea of bringing, having a space for elders to take action. And one of the early members of what is now called Elders Action Network took one of Al Gore's climate reality trainings. And he came out of that and said, OMG, we've got to do something. I mean, we've got to get active. And this was Paul Severance. And he talked to the founder of Elders Action Network. And they decided to form a, a group within it. A five, you know, it's a 501c3 called Elders Climate Action. And Elders Climate Action held its first in-person conference in September 2015 in Washington, DC. Uh, in conjunction with people from other 
climate activist groups who came to do training and, and help us. And that's how I got involved because I, you know, it was like, huh, me step out, do something. Well, I'm concerned about climate. Well, okay, maybe, maybe I'll calm my racing heart and my anxiety and I'll actually go join this conference. They were going to lobby on the Hill. And I, you know, it was like, woo, can I do that? Well, I went and I, my guess is there were 45 to 60 elder people there gathered and there were speakers and there was a purpose and there was training. And we went over and met with me members of Congress. And I just felt such a community, such energy and support and focus that I was, you know, and I, I was just overwhelmed. And then at the end, I got this nice little form that said, you know, would you be willing to volunteer? And it had various, like it was the review of, of the conference and how did you like it? But at the end, would I volunteer? And I said, yes. And I got a call the next day or two days later and someone who'd been at the conference and, um, the rest is history. I have been an active member since 2015 and uh, worked in, a, in areas of, of communications, newsletter, things like that. I formed a chapter in my geographic area and I am now co-chair of Elders Climate Action with my co-chair, Jerry Friedman. So that, that I, I'm sorry for going on so long, but that's sort of a a quick overview of, of how we got started. There's there's a lot more to that story, but. Uh, no, it's good, it's interesting. What I, I looked at your website, of course, but uh, it doesn't say whether or not there's a uh, an age cutoff. No, we, we, we do, I mean, we are generally elders and we've got members who are in their probably 50s, 60s, 70s, today's my 70th birthday, by the way, uh, 80s, even in their 90s. And, um, but we had a member of one of our chapters who was 18 years old. So we're not going to discriminate on the basis of age, but our focus, our mission is to reach out to elders to get them involved, to bring them in, use their expertise, their experience, their knowledge, um, and, and turn it to something good. So that's our focus. And just quickly to cut in, we do a lot of collaborative, collaborative work with other groups, including Sunrise Movement, Zero Hour. We're very supportive of the youth groups. So by being Elders Climate Action, we're not pushing all those other groups aside, rather we're providing a resource and a support for other climate action organizations and groups. Okay, um, I, I was gonna, uh, maybe I'll say it anyway. I, um, every once in a while I'm, I'm in a store, I haven't been for a while, uh, that has a sign that says, uh, you break it, you own it. And when I first saw the title of the group, I thought this kind of sounded like we're, we're all basically the same generation, the three of us. So. It's like we broke it, so we own it in a sense. I mean, we are not the generation that started the Industrial Revolution, but our generation is the first one to sort of face the facts that scientists were giving us and not doing very much about it or not doing as much as, as we should have. And so from my side, I like the fact that elderly or elderly people are really stepping up. You're right about the knowledge and it feels good. And I think part of what I keep reading is that a lot of younger people are in a sense irritated. They think our generation uh, in a sense cheated them. We didn't do what we could have done to provide them with a world that's as good as it could be. And I sometimes see a little a little resentment. And, and uh, we talked with younger people that say that you know, they've, they've watched what's happened and we feel like it's all on us. So the idea that you're doing this to me seems really, really good. And, yes, uh, to 
Oh, sorry. I, I no, would comment. No, no. Uh, um, yes, we were. I mean, if I were, if I were twelve to twenty now, and looking at the chaotic future, I'd be, I'd be terrified and angry, and um, it, it, you know. If, I don't know, a year or so ago, some of the youth groups started referring to our generation as the, you know, the boomers in a bad sense. And, um, you know, you boomers, you're the, you're the ones who really caused all of this problem. And um, what we did in Elders Climate Action is we decided we would call ourselves the Boomer Brigade. We're here as a brigade of boomers to deal with climate change. And, you know, honestly, to be fair, we were raised in a World War II, post-World War II universe in which all of the things around us were givens. We didn't know that the industrialization, uh, the mass production of automobiles, um, all of these things were contributing to what would be the destruction of the very ecosystem on which we all live and survive. We grew up, you know, as innocent people in our division of labor uh, corners, whether you were a lawyer or a historian or an engineer or a bricklayer, whatever we were doing, this was, we were fitting into the structure around us and doing our work. And, you know, when Jim Hansen first raised the climate change issue in mid 80s, you know, it sounded like something vague, off in the future, 2050 and plus. Now we're seeing how much faster it's impacting us and we are seeing how entrenched um, the, the corporate and political infrastructure is in terms of pivoting to address and avert the worst impacts of this crisis. So I guess, are we to blame? Yes, but I think we need to be careful that it's not so much a moral blame on individuals. It's a, oh my God, we inherited a, a world that was based on economic growth and industrialization and global trade and all of these things. And we could not see outside the blinders around us until certain information, certain natural signals started coming and we're waking up. We're waking up and we're taking action. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned that is that we're seeing it now too and what we read and what we here, which is a lot of um, what we're seeing right now are things that were predicted to happen years from now. Mm -hmm. yes. which is much, much, it's happening faster than scientists predicted. I'm assuming part of that is uh, due to scientists wanting to be careful, not overstate um, things so that people could uh, dismiss what they're saying. But for whatever, whatever the reasons are, I get the feeling that more and more people in the scientific community are, uh, in a sense, on the edge of panic. It, uh, it, it's, it's gotten really scary all of a sudden. It is. And it is happening a lot faster than was predicted in the 1980s, the 1990s, even early 2000s, that, you know, they were still looking further out. And I, my guess is, yes, scientists are very cautious. But one of the things about climate change is it's global and it's multifactorial. And so where science is based on the test tube in the laboratory, and you're looking at carefully segregated elements and factors that you're testing, pulling together all of the inputs into climate change and all of the outputs and their interactions, is a highly complex thing that's not part of the normal, whether it's meteorological or geographic, geological or other kind of science. So I think that as looking at climate change has increased in the science world and more and more areas within science are looking at it as 
as well as the impacts hitting us much more quickly, um, I think we are getting we are getting better scientific analysis from more perspectives, and it's more accurate. Yeah, it seems like a lot of what we're seeing now is uh, real world evidence rather than projections or laboratory experiments. Um, the other thing I know is that Elders Climate Action has a, a very long list of priorities. Mm -hmm. And within them, uh, there's a lot of talk about justice. And I don't believe all the environmental organizations are as upfront focused on justice. Do you know where that came from or who, how that got started? Well, it, 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 it is complicated, but it's the same kind of complication as the history of, of what created, what in our world created climate change. And that is that the, the social, economic, environmental justice issues, um, injustice issues, I should say, have been created by the same forces, uh, redlining, uh, on, you know, only the poor can live near polluting uh, factories, uh, and they suffer more from, you know, disease and 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 problems as a result of that pollution. So, a, actually, a lot of the environmental groups are looking at environmental equity and justice. Uh, it it is part of dealing with climate change because. We need to make it, one, we need to make it clear to ourselves that impacts of climate change and impacts of the industrial chemical world we live in are affecting people, even if they're not affecting directly or as clearly the privileged who are living off in their suburban communities, far from <laughs> polluting sources and things like that. And that those are communities who, who also need to be involved in this and, and both hear their voices and give them a say. So I know that US Climate Action Network, which is a organization that includes more than 170 environmental climate change groups from very large to small local ones, equity and justice are at the center of their work on their vision for equitable climate action. And the, the VICA, the vision for equitable climate action that we, we support um, is very aggressive on addressing the causes of climate change and how to make those transitions in ways that do not further harm those who have been sort of mistreated by our, our capitalist industrial system to date. All right, that's uh, pretty good to hear. It's, it's more upfront now. Uh, in terms of, you're doing all sorts of things. I mean, from education, uh, spreading information to hands-on individual actions. While you're doing all this, what, is, what do you see as like the greatest struggle or the most difficult thing to overcome? Is it uh, sort of a lack of information in general or sort of a hesitancy of people to act or is it a big kind of big part of it to be put on uh, politics? You've just asked such a complex question. I could probably go on for 45 minutes alone on that <laughs> one. Um, I think if we if we think about elders climate action and let me address it from that perspective. We're dealing with people who some of whom are still working. Some of whom who've left their their normal jobs, but maybe doing some kind of consulting or work and then a lot of people who are retired and they're in all parts of our country from Arizona and Texas to Massachusetts, to California, to Maryland and DC where I am, Illinois. Um, and addressing climate change, as, as you've hinted already, is multifactorial. So one of the, what are the challenges? The challenges are multifactorial. Yes, 
We need to, at a global level, make sure that greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, that countries that can't afford to reduce their emissions or who can't produce the energy they need without some kind of a support get it. We need to make sure that fossil fuel industries are no longer subsidized <laughs> and that you know they work through how you account for the, the um, frozen assets that they've put on their books that should have no value whatsoever. I mean, there, there are all kinds of things that need to be done. And what we are doing is we're reaching out to those older Americans across the country at, to find where they are and what they can do. So to give an example, our Ann Arbor, Michigan chapter started with somebody who was very interested in developing composting and, and having the city of Ann Arbor adopt composting. Compost waste is a great source of, source of methane emission. It, you know, it, it can, the compost can be turned into fertilizers and soils that replace you know, nitrogen and other things that are destructive of our environment. And that chapter started, they managed to get a grant and oh my God, he is now sitting with the city council, you know, and, and they've really gotten that to take off. That was a local action aimed at getting a local area involved and engaged in climate change. We've got, we've got groups who are working on state level legislation or regulation, federal level, of course, and then all kinds of other things in between. And it, it sort of depends where you are geographically, your personality, your background, where you can get other outreach to others and bring them in to work with you. And so part of what we're doing is we're providing a platform of actions and mentoring and resources. And we've got 12 chapters and we meet monthly with all the chapter leaders. We're doing the things to provide the support, the incentive, the initiative, the energy to get more and more people out there doing whatever they can do where they are. Yeah, I noticed that you have uh, chapters and it looked like, it's like you're saying that uh, each one is somewhat local in terms of what they're doing. Um, how, I don't, I'm not sure the way to say it, how difficult is it or how, how easy is it? How, what are you doing to try to find ways for more chapters to get started? Or what can you tell people to do to join? Well, we, we, we keep a central, our, our one staff person. We are an all volunteer organization. We bring in enough donations every year to hire one person who does sort of the, the support, the technological support, handles uh, some central things. She's fantastic. She does the work of two, but otherwise, all of us are volunteers. Every committee member, every, everything we do is we do it on our energy, our time, our, our passion. So going back to your question about chapters, we keep a list of our members, the information we have about them, and we can tell, let's say I'm living in North Carolina and I want to start a chapter. I can reach out in my area and see if I can get friends, neighbors, other people to join with me. And we'll put together a vision of, of what do we want to do as a North Carolina chapter? Or is it, you know, more a city county chapter? Or is it a regional chapter, a Southeast chapter? And we'll put together some ideas and we will um, put together a chapter application. And there is a form and you describe who the leadership is and what you want to do. And then as a chapter gets formed, we can use our, our list of quote members or followers uh, to take an email that you prepare that is an invitation to join the chapter. And we will send it out to all those people. We will protect their privacy by inviting them using the BCC function 
blind carbon copy. So everyone who gets it sees themselves, but they're not seeing the 50 to 200 other names. And that becomes an invitation to join the chapter, reach out to the chapter leadership. And that's how a lot of our chapters have gotten started. And we've got an increasing number of people interested in forming chapters uh, across a wide variety of you know, our, our areas, districts. And um, I, I'm sure there are other questions you have. But is there a lot of inter interaction between uh, chapters or is, does everything kind of come back to the central office? No, we are, we, we operate by what we call the Hamez principles and they are very open and, and um, we have a monthly council of chapters meeting, which I and Jeff Haverly, one of my colleagues leads. And this is all the leadership of all the chapters comes together and it's a combination of sharing what they're doing with each other, sharing their the difficulties they're running into and seeing if others have ideas or solutions, finding out where there are needs for resources. We have put together um, separate sessions to help people who are not so comfortable with social media because each of our chapters can have a Facebook page or Instagram use, so we're doing that. We do, uh, some of our chapters do their own newsletters. E Elders Climate Action National has a newsletter we send out once a month with information and action items, but some of our chapters are big enough to have done their own newsletters. And so we're doing, we're gonna do a, a training session where those chapters that are doing newsletters talk about how, they're, how they do them, how they put them together, the persons who stepped up to volunteer to do that work. And, and so our chapters very actively share with each other. Uh, and then we try to provide centralized resources and materials that they can turn to. But it, it's very much grassroots, homegrown, sharing, and you know, other than abiding by the 501c3 rules and, and some of the basic um, principles of elders climate action the chapters can do what they what they feel is most effective in their area all right i have, I'm a, I have a question um you mentioned al gore originally that he had a like a seminar where um, one of the gentlemen that start original members uh went there and he got uh i'd like to know more about the class that he took with al gore uh, that you mentioned Al Gore has a very large organization called Climate Reality. You can look it up on the internet. And they have been doing online training since the pandemic started, sometimes with 1,200 or 2,000 people there to learn. And it's, it's basically, and I, I can't tell you, is it two days, three days? They, they don't burn you out with eight hours a day of Zoom. But Al Gore does presentations, there are other presentations, and they invite people to join state or local chapters or form them. But it is very, very, a combination of education on climate change. And again, just like Elders Climate Action, bringing people together to take action, to be aware of what's happening in your city, county, state legislators, to step up and speak out in favor of you know, laws that would require uh, zero emission, you know, net zero emissions by 2030 and all of the actions that need to be taken. And frankly, over the last years, the most effective action has been at the state and local level. One, because you couldn't get anything through at the federal level, but two, because in getting it through at the state or local level, you're proving it can be done. You're creating models and you're also creating pressure on industry. If you look at California with its regulations on automobile emissions, the point is if, if that stays, then the car manufacturing companies have a dilemma. Are they producing cars that can be sold only in states other than California? 
Or are they producing cars that meet the environmental requirements of California and they're sold elsewhere? So even state regulation can have an impact on the corporate world mm -hmm. that sells its product and engages across all of the states. That is really interesting. Um, Al Gore, uh, you mentioned, he's been the leader uh, of environmental for, for decades. Uh, he has a passion that, I, uh, that is unbelievable uh, for what you just talked about, for how he's got together and bring groups of people together and educate people of the world. Yeah. And, and, and we certainly, many of our leadership and elders climate action have taken the climate reality training. I did. Um, and some of our members are, I mean, a lot of, of our elders climate action members, you know, if, if you go out there and you want to do it alone, then it's a fractured universe. And one of our principles is collaboration, working with other groups, working with other organizations, arm in arm, so to speak, so that we're magnifying the voice and the impact. So um, we have a collaborations committee and we build and develop and work on those collaborations to be able to support climate actions, bills, learn from the other groups. You know, we don't have to learn everything from zero ourselves, but rather we, by working together and sharing, we're able to be more effective, more efficient, more powerful. I'm assuming part of that, well, I on your website, you have um, monthly Better Together sessions. The, okay, yes, the Better Together is, we decided about a year ago that we needed to move equity and environmental justice upward in our, in, in our list of priorities. That is, it had always been part of what we were concerned about, but we felt that we needed to educate our members and make sure that everyone understood the role. Um, and so we formed an equity and environmental justice committee. I wanna say the end of last year, the beginning of this year. And that committee has been working together and now they have started the Better Together programs. So I think we've just had the first one. But again, the idea is to help our membership in a variety of ways, teach them about the inequities and injustices that just as we didn't know that all of that you know, carbon emissions was, was causing climate change when we were teenagers and young adults um, that many people don't, don't see or know or feel the impacts that are out there. Secondly, to help them shape how they interact and their actions to be more aware and sensitive and to, to again, to grow our movement as the kind of movement that we want to be. All right, and you also have a tool shop work or a toolkit workshop. Yes, I that, think it was that is, yeah, that's coming up. The what just to, to give you a back, we have at national level, we have passionate volunteer members. So we have a communications committee that puts together our newsletter and action bulletins and that that has been developing those over time. So our newsletter used to be more just information and now it is focused much more on action items. Here's things you as a member can do, you know, click on this button, look at this. We have an education committee that really formed in the last, I wanna say, year, it, it used to be that communications did communications and education both. Well, the education committee got formed off. We've got new, very active members, including uh, a professor at Cornell University. And now they've been putting together our monthly national calls where we usually have outside speakers and putting together some of these 
webinar series or workshop series. So that's another response to the needs of our members. We have, as I said, a collaborations committee that, that works with everything from Moms Clean Air Force and US Climate Action Network to all kinds of other groups that are focused on climate change. We have a policy committee that has at least six members at this point, many of whom have degrees in chemistry, engineering, have been at the EPA or, or other places. And they, they look at the policies mostly at the national level or things like the vision for equitable climate action that we actually help shape that US CAN's statement of these are the policies we think that need to be adopted in the US and actually globally to address climate change and to transform our world into one that's sustainable. And the policy committee looks at these things and looks at, oh, are, you know, is the idea of, you know, burning wood pellets, is that false solution? I mean, you're taking wood that has absorbed carbon from the atmosphere uh, and now you're burning it and putting it out there. Uh, is carbon capture a, a realistic uh, option given the current technologies? So the policy committee helps us evaluate policies and see where we can feel very comfortable being strong in favor and where we think there are issues that we're a little more concerned about. Um, and then let's see what we have the Council of Chapters, which I've already talked about, which is a committee that brings together leadership from all of our chapters to, to address the, the issues that are coming up and, and share information and mutually mentor. And I may still be, oh, well, we have a coordinating council. The coordinating council is made up of leaders from all of those committees that come together every other week and that are sort of, again, they're coordinating to make sure that we're working together, that the things we're moving ahead on uh, are well supported. And so, you know, we are, I don't know, we're like an octopus, a jellyfish. I mean, we're, we're all these individuals who as volunteers come together to form an organism that has a number of tentacles that are doing different things. And we try to keep it all together and focused in the right direction. And, you know, it, it, it's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see how we can all work together coming from our different backgrounds and perspectives. And it's been a joy. Yeah, the last sort of big question I was trying to ask is, um, you said uh, that you were constrained because of your uh, nonprofit status. And I'm assuming that part of what you mean by that is you like everyone else are, have a constraint uh, in terms of what you can do politically in terms of supporting or uh, encouraging yeah. people to pick their candidates. How, but at the same time, you and we, everybody else that's involved with the, with trying to solve the problem is fighting with people that don't have those rates. Well, I, I, I don't know if I used the word constraint. I did say we were a 501c3. And I, I suppose for some people, we can't lobby and we, as an organization, and we cannot promote political candidates as an organization. But we can educate, we can meet with members of Congress, members of state legislators, tell them what is important on climate change, explain why we like or don't like a certain bill or where we think there should be amendments. Actually, there, there isn't much constraint. Um, we partnered uh, over the last four years, I want to say, was something called the Environmental Voter Project. And the Environmental Voter Project, which it was founded out of, out of uh, I think, Boston, Massachusetts, its aim was to reach out to environmentalists who, given their voting records, don't tend to show up and vote. So you, can, you don't know how people vote, but there are records you can see if somebody is a registered voter and doesn't vote. And then you can also check to see if those people 
are environmentalists. I don't do that. That's in the background with somebody's computers. But they come up with lists of people in jurisdictions who are environmentalists or environmentally favorite, favor environmental concerns, but who haven't been voting. And they have like tweeting or phone banks to reach out to those people to urge them to vote for the climate, to, to go out and, and not to advocate for a specific candidate, but simply trying to get other people out to vote who you believe if they're, you know, if they do vote and they use their intelligence will vote for people who are more likely than not to support actions to address climate change while there's still time. So, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do as members of a 501c3. And of course, we can all step out and do it on our own without doing it with our Elders Climate Action hat and shirt on. <laughs> I'm, I'm not wearing the shirt right now, but um, so there's nothing that stops us from individual as individuals from taking those actions. And we just have to be careful not to overstep certain IRS lines when we're acting as a group. All right, very good. <laughs> That might help a lot of people to understand that. So I guess we're about done or, or running out of time. Thank you so much for talking with us. Well, it's it's been a pleasure. I you know I don't know much about you or what you're doing, but but from the questions you're asking, it sounds to me like you are doing what you can to press for action on climate change. If you feel that you would like to have another conversation with me, either because of questions you couldn't ask or to clarify some things, then you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I can make myself available. Very good, thank you. Well, thank, thank you. For you. That invitation. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing everything you've done. You, you are doing an amazing job. It, 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 it just um, amazes me that somebody like you is working as hard as you are to get this job done for our environment. So I'm really, uh, I, I'm really amazed that you're working so hard to make it happen. Well, let me tell you a secret. I still have a day job. So I'm doing this on top of my day job. Now I am retiring at the end of this calendar year and then I will be able to put a lot more time and energy in. But I am putting every free moment of energy and people who haven't retired yet can get involved and there's plenty for them to do in the slots of time they have available and for our retirees, some of whom are going, now what am I gonna do? Now that I have all this free time. Uh, well, we've got something and you can feel very good doing it. For sure. Okay. Well, thank you for taking the time today for us. And um, I don't have anything else. Dennis, do you have anything else? No, I uh, just really appreciate what you, what you said. I think, I think you might help a lot of people understand what they can do. Uh, I think, and you're right, there are a lot of people who retire and uh, don't want to go golfing every day. And uh, doing something productive, I think, sounds really good. So having something that makes it easy for people to get involved with, no matter how much uh, work is involved once they do it, I think is uh, really productive. So thank well, you. Yes, and, and let me assure you that there are people who join who take on small little pieces of things that they want to do. Uh, some of them episodic and others take on more. And it's your interest, your passion, the connections you make. But it, we have a community and it, it is wonderful uh, to be part of that community. And so I invite anyone to step out and, and look at our website. Um, join where we're free. So, you know, you just fill in the, your contact information on the website and you'll get the newsletters and bulletins. You can, you can see, reach out and do as little or as much as you wish. Yeah, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoy your, your asking such uh, careful, thoughtful questions. And uh, I hope I, I did some of them justice.
Uh, you did, and I hope we talk again. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, bye now.